So this demonstration is going to be on Sunday, September 21. And I really echo that, that sentiment here, that we do need to change everything and that we do need to bend the course of history. And this is a very important development, and I, I do hope, again, all of you will be taking part of it. Part in it. And we also encourage everyone to, to stand firm in your conviction to fight to save the planet. I mean, the problem is bigger than big oil, and it's bigger than the big corporations. It's actually systemic. The use of fossil fuels is systemic to the entire capitalist economy of this country and most of the, and most of the world, for that matter. So it requires... A, each of us not back off from our commitment and adapt ourselves to the so-called realities of, of real world politics. As a part of this effort, um, the Revolutionary Communist Party put out a call, and it's up on the, on the table where you came in. I, I hope everybody will get one, calling for a contingent uh, to march in this parade, and a contingent that is organized around the idea that uh, capitalism is, is destroying our planet and that it re will nothing, we require a revolution, nothing less, in order to resolve this problem. A major focus of the plans is, is building this contingent, and the contingent should speak to the tens of thousands marching and to people in the city who will be watching and the many millions around the country and the world who will see the march in, in all different kinds of media and social media. This contingent should radiate the revolution. It should be full of verve, huge brilliant banners, chants, t-shirts, drum corps, lively involvement of students, as well as many from the most oppressed sections of society. The spirit of internationalism must be conveyed in diverse ways, and the contingent should be disciplined and project a passion for the planet and its people. With its slogan, capitalism is destroying the planet, we need revolution, nothing less. And I encourage any of you who would like to join with us in helping to build this contingent at the end of the program tonight. We'll get together for a few minutes and and uh, also when if you go to the March website you if you look at the hubs that are there there's a revolution solution hub and that's how you stay in touch with building this contingent and, and be on the mailing list for it. Okay, so now moving one step further to the specifics of this evening, it's really very, very exciting to have with us this evening Professor Philip Kitcher from Columbia University. You know, here at Revolution Books, we're big on science. Um, both the science about the threat that the planet and the people face, but also being scientific about the solution. Um, Philip Kitcher's talk this evening, Climate Change and the Hard Problems, is going to actually really ground us in the scientific realities of of what we're facing. Professor Kitcher is a professor of philosophy at, at Columbia, and his particular field is the philosophy of science. And philosophy of science deals a lot with that field called epistemology, which is the question of dealing with the truth, how we find out about the truth, where is the truth, how do we know what's true? Um, and this is, these, all of these issues are extremely contentious. And one of the things that it was exciting when I first met Professor Kitcher and looked at his work was the, the passion that he has for um, going to the public and, and in, involving people in understanding the need for the, the ordinary people in a democratic society to to have a commitment to the truth and to science and knowing what is real. I will just read you just the titles of a few of his books which will give you an idea of what he's been about. Abusing Science, The Case Against Creationism. Science, Truth and Democracy. Living with Darwin, Evolution, Design and the Future of Faith. Science in a Democratic Society. And the last one I like best, Life After Faith, The Case for Secular Humanism. So with that, let me introduce to you Professor Philip Kitcher. Well, thank you, for, thank you very much, Clark. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm, is the microphone not working? OK, can you um, turn it a little louder? Um, OK, so. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to discussing with you, and so I would, I'm going to keep my presentation relatively streamlined so we can get into a serious discussion. Um, can I have the next slide? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. So let's start, let's start with the easy stuff. There's something that's absolutely uncontroversial that everybody bar about five people who have qualifications to think about it are agreed on. And that is the fact that human practices, specifically 
the fact that we use enormous amounts of fossil fuels are contributing to a rise in the global mean temperature. Now let me emphasize one thing. The global mean temperature is just that. It's an average across the Earth's surface. And people get very excited sometimes because they say, oh, there's all this snow around, we had a very cold winter. Doesn't mean a thing, right? Um, the fact that it snows a lot where you are, or we have a relatively cool summer, that's not important. What's important is the average temperature around the Earth's surface. And the evidence that, that the Earth's average temperature is rising and that we are causing it is overwhelming. Next slide, please, Clark. Okay, now, the, here's the sort of consensus view of the situation. Even if we start right now and make really effective steps towards reducing emissions of fossil fuels, it's going to be extremely hard to keep the mean global temperature from rising by two degrees Celsius by 2100. That, that, the index point, the base point for this is the 1990 temperature. So if you think of the 1990 average temperature, uh, it's going to be very hard to keep it from uh, 2100 under two degrees above that. Now, if you don't do anything at all, if you have what's sometimes called the business as usual scenario, and I emphasize here the business as usual, um, then the increase is going to be much greater. So can you show the next slide, please? So some people at MIT who know a lot about these things, you can go on the web, uh, go to uh, the climate gamble or the global gamble. I can't remember exactly what it's called, and you can spin the roulette wheel electronically and see what you get time after time. Now, if you don't do anything at all, the best case scenario is a rise of three to four degrees Celsius. Um, most probable is four to five degrees Celsius. And right up there, there's something very, very worrying indeed where it says greater than seven. Now, just to give you some idea of what this means, the last time the Earth was five degrees Celsius colder than now, you wouldn't be sitting here. There would be huge ice sheets, very, very thick ice sheets, way, way up above your head. The last time the Earth was five degrees Celsius warmer than now, um, there was no ice anywhere on the planet at all. There were swamps, tropical swamps, right up to the polar circles alligators and crocodiles were thriving all over the place. Okay, so that's a five degree Celsius change. Now notice that that's not off the charts by any means if we don't do anything about climate change. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we know the, that we are causing this problem? Well, Michael Mann, who was for a time when he was at the University of Virginia pursued and by the then Attorney General, the guy who just, the Republican candidate for governor who just lost in the last election. Michael Mann is the author of this famous graph, the so-called hockey stick. You can see why it's called a hockey stick. If you look back into the past, you can see there's a shaft and it's relatively flat with a slight decline and then since the industrial revolution really kicked in there's a sharp uptick and that's the blade of the stick. Now we can measure the more recent parts of that but how do we reconstruct uh, the, these past temperatures? Unfortunately when the good Lord created the earth he didn't favor us by putting in nice little thermometers all over the place so that the temperatures were always easy to, be, to record. And so Michael Mann has to do um, sort of roundabout methods for finding out what the temperature is. You look at uh, data from tree rings, you look at uh, data from the composition of so-called ice cores and so forth, and you can reconstruct the Earth's history in terms of its temperature in that way. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now, this is a really easy problem. We can see the correlation between the Industrial Revolution and the uptick, and we know that there's a real relation. It was discovered actually in the 19th century 
between the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. People mainly think in terms of carbon dioxide, but methane is also important. Um, we know the physics of this is thoroughly worked out, that these gases trap heat. Greenhouse isn't, isn't an entirely good metaphor, what, it, what you should think of is, is that the more of that stuff you get in the atmosphere, the more heat gets trapped and doesn't radiate back into space. No other known mechanism can account for the rise since the Industrial Revolution. So if you were Sherlock Holmes, you'd know exactly how to solve this problem, right? You've got a suspect. The suspect uh, could do the crime, was at the scene of the crime. No other suspect that you have could do the crime, had a motive, was at the scene of the crime. You know, the case is really open and shut. So why has it been so hard? And that's because we live in what is officially a democracy, but unfortunately a dysfunctional democracy. Can I have the next slide, please? What we have is a bunch of people um, fogging the issue so that citizens are confused if not misled by a whole variety of people. And they've been at it on various issues since uh, really the 1950s and 1960s. They've been obfuscating the facts about what happens to people when they smoke, about acid rain, about the ozone hole, about secondhand smoke. And now they're really interested in obfuscating the facts about climate change. In this extremely good book, which I hope you have in your store, um, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway call these people merchants of doubt, because that's what they do. And they hold up the discussion and the conversation. Okay, let's go on. All right, so here are the sorts of figures that you see in scientific works about the Earth's rising temperature. Okay? But if you go on the web, or if you look around certain kinds of popular press, you'll see some rather different graphs. Uh, these, for example, which have absolutely no relation to the scientific facts. But they're put out there, and people who want to believe that it's all all right, believe them. In Britain, Christopher Booker, who writes for the T Daily Telegraph, um, calls the climate change consensus the worst scientific scandal of our generation. A um, website, very, very clever and slick website, um, if you want to Google hide the decline, um, they've got a really slick video, um, publishes images like this. Poor Al Gore shows up at the Capitol for a global warming conference and of course it's buried under snow. Now that's exactly the error I warned you against at the very beginning, mistaking the local for the global average. Next slide, please. And that's had an impact, especially in the English-speaking world. In the United States, um, you know, belief in human-caused global warming goes up and down. It was relatively high in 2007, it dropped in 2009 in the wake of the, of the financial crash. It's been coming up since then. And a minority of our citizens take this to be a very serious problem. In 2007, it, the numbers were getting up there, 45%. But recently, uh, it's been much lower than that. Can I have the next slide, please? And if you look elsewhere, uh, if you look at the UK, it's roughly the same. Australia, uh, it's roughly the same. And that's what's enabled the Prime Minister recently to roll back the very progressive energy policy that was put in by his predecessor, who imposed a carbon tax in Australia. Uh, Abbott has now uh, rolled that back. And despite the fact that Australia in the last decade or so has been ravaged by all sorts of wildfires, Nevertheless, Australian public opinion uh, doesn't take this problem particularly seriously. Canada used to be a lot better. But then, in the last couple of years, they got really excited about the oil prospects. And interestingly, the Canadian citizens 
um, have now backed off from concerns about climate change. I can have the next slide, please. Oh, next slide. Okay, so let me think about why this happens in democracy. Why is it that citizens don't vote uh, for progressive environmental policies on this very important issue? Well, there's a myth about democracy in many countries, and it applies in particular to the United States. And that myth says, well, you know, the people should decide and issues should be freely debated and we do that and the people have decided and they're not really interested in this issue so we shouldn't do anything about it. You know, they, they rank this 19th on the list of problems to be solved. It's not really that important. Next slide, please. And if that's right, then nothing is going to be done. Nothing's going to be done in the United States and nothing's going to be done in Canada or Australia or the United Kingdom four very important countries uh, for this particular problem. Now let's ask a question. Does that really enhance the freedom of the people? Well, in a certain sense it does, because it answers to the preferences that they express in their votes and in the opinion polls. But I conjecture that it doesn't really answer to what they want. Because very few of us are so focused on driving a very big car or keeping our homes very, very warm or not paying a reasonable amount for heating oil and gasoline, that we put those sorts of things ahead of the well-being of the people who will come after us. Many people think about this issue as James Hansen, who first called called the issue uh, to public attention does in terms of what happens to the grandchildren. So he, Hansen's written this very good popular book called Storms of My Grandchildren. And that seems to me something that's deeply human and deeply humane to want things to be good for the people who come after us. Not necessarily our biological relatives but for those of us who live in New York for the people who live in New York after us. For the people with whom we are in community, we are probably all members of many different communities, we want the successors in those communities to be able to thrive. Can I have the next slide, please? I want to suggest that a real democracy comes in three tiers. It isn't just the standard machinery of elections, votes, and so on, so that you can tell that there's a democracy in place when people come out and they wave their purple fingers in the air. That was an extraordinarily vulgar view of what democracy consists in. No, democracy happens when people's freedom is genuinely enhanced through their involvement in decisions about the matters that affect them. That's what real democracy is. Now, I venture to suggest that we really don't live in a democracy anymore. What we live in is what I, I would call a statistical plutocracy. There are these people, we'll call them the plutocrats. They have a lot of money, they invest a lot of money in all sorts of advertising and um, encouraging various kinds of candidates to campaign. Having invested that money, they then expect us to serve as cogs in a big political machine, to go into the voting booth and to pull the levers in the ways that they want. So our preferences are manipulated. So when we go and vote, we vote actually against our long-term interests. I call it a statistical plutocracy because, you know, it's got a high chance of working, but there's no guarantee, right? They invest the money, and they hope that they'll get the outcomes they want. But sometimes things go wrong. You know, sometimes even a black guy gets to be elected as president. Um, you know, things, things go astray sometimes. But on the whole, they win out. I can have the next slide, please. Now, democracy as I see it, as we have it, is the outgrowth of a historical process in which people reacted against the obvious ways in which their lives were interfered with. That guy at the top left is really getting his life interfered with. Um, 
this guy at the bottom left is really doing a lot of interfering. And the, the one at the right is a reminder that even when you think you've attained a democratic state, you can still relapse into a condition where somebody can impose his will on millions of people. Uh, next slide, please. But we also live in a different age than our predecessors. We live in a society that's so complicated and in which the causal effects of what people do are so hidden that it's often difficult for them to figure out where the limitations they feel in their daily lives are coming from. They think of themselves as free, but they're actually inhibited in all sorts of ways. I think that's our predicament. So the kids who go to school in that pretty run-down schoolroom at the top right, or the people who live in those buildings in the bottom right, or the people who breathe that air, don't understand where the bad things are coming from. They don't understand the limitations on their own freedom. So our problem is to renew democracy so that it isn't vulnerable to manipulation of information, so that we can find out the things that we need to know to advance our ends. Can I go on? Now, you might think that free speech is a way of doing that. And that's a classic idea. John Milton got it right, I think, in the 17th century. But he was very optimistic. The last sentence of this famous quote from Areopagitica says, let her and falsehood grapple, whoever knew truth put to the worse. And then he adds, in a free and open encounter. And that's a crucial phrase. Next slide, please. Many people, when they think about uh, free speech and the ways in which free speech advances democracy, think about John Stuart Mill, who co-wrote a famous essay on liberty with his uh, eventually wife, Harriet Taylor. Mill is even more optimistic than Milton. He thinks that the truth is going to win out. But it's not going to win out if the truth is manipulated if we have pe merchants of doubt out there who are controlling the media and who have more time at the microphone than other people do and are able simply to deny what scientists have discovered. That's the predicament in which we live. Next slide, please. So our public discussions really ought to work in a way so that at the end of the day people can make up their minds, can recognize the evidence, and can attune their votes and their thinking to what that evidence shows. But instead, we are systematically manipulated. Cloud and obfuscation reigns. And that means that we vote against our interests again and again and again. And it's particularly remarkable in this debate. And that's why you see those appallingly low numbers about taking the problem of climate change seriously. Now, I started off by saying this is a really easy problem. It's a really easy problem because the scientists have solved it. It's been made artificially hard because of the decay of American democracy, British democracy, Australian democracy, and Canadian democracy. But I'm afraid it gets worse, because even if people took the basic step of saying climate change is real, we're causing it, there would still be two very, very difficult things to work out. One of them is to appreciate the urgency of the situation, and the second is to find an effective solution. So let me take, these, take you through these briefly, and then we'll get to the real sort of punchy part. Okay, Clark. So, how do you recruit people for action? There are all sorts of problems that many people in our society face. Why should we, uh, how can we get them to take this particular problem seriously? After all, as I'll suggest later on, Americans and other people in affluent countries are going to have to make sacrifices if this problem is to be solved. And if we could only say to them, look, 
in 20 years, in 40 years, in 60 years, this particular region of your country that you care about is going to suffer these kinds of adverse effects, then it will be much easier to get the message across. But you can't responsibly say that. Climate models can predict various things about the future, but unfortunately they can make general predictions, not specific ones. So the climate models that scientists work on are very sensitive to all sorts of parameter values, which we can't often measure very precisely. And so there's a range of outcomes that climate scientists tell us about, and they can't tell us which one is going to be the real one. All right, there are general threats. Next slide, please. So we know, for example, that the sea is likely to rise over the next century, century and a half, by about a meter or more, even on the best case scenarios. And that means that quite a lot of Miami is going to go under. So people who live near the coasts can start to worry about this. But there's plenty of time, so the politicians will tell us. We can move away, we can move gently away from these places that are, are likely to be flooded. Next slide, please. But the trouble is that that's really not the whole story. Because what happens is that there's a distribution of sea levels. As people in New York and New Jersey are thoroughly familiar with, sometimes the tide is quite a lot higher than it is at others. And what happens when the temperature shifts is that a distribution curve gets shifted to the right. And you get much more of what used to be record hot weather, and you get hotter weather than you've ever seen before. And you get a lot more heavy rainfall. Now, some people actually think that it's even worse than this, that what happens when the climate warms is that you not just get the shift of this curve to the right, but it's as if this point were fixed, and now a hand came down like that and pushed it out so that you'll get even more extreme weather. Next slide, please. And this is a simple chart of the frequency of extreme weather events during the course of the last century or so. And you can see it's increased enormously. That's what the future is going to be like. It's not just going to be a gently rising sea uh, and as, you know, as the people in Miami see that it's now up half a meter, they can say, well, let's move somewhere else. No, what's going to happen is that the sea is going to rise and at the same time the frequency, the amplitude of the storms is going to increase. And that means a lot of difficulties for all sorts of people. Next slide, please. It means a terrible difficulty for the, for the uh, Southwest for a quite different reason. That's likely to get so hot and to have so little precipitation that it'll turn into a dust bowl. Scientists working actually at Columbia's Lamont Doherty Observatory have a very scary model in which the San Francisco Bay floods and the whole of California's Central Valley turns into a salt marsh. Well, if you've uh, thought about where some of your food comes from recently, you'll know that that's really quite a serious change. Uh, next slide, please. So there's, there are lots and lots of different kinds of effects that, we, that are going to come with global warming. Rapid snowpack melt on mountains with immediate flooding in the valleys below and then followed by drought. Uh, I used to live in California, uh, so I'm quite familiar with what happens in the spring there. You know, it's, you've got a nice thick snowpack and, uh, and it runs off fairly gradually and that provides the water for basically what is a semi-arid region in California. But if the snowpack becomes much um, attenuated, is much thinner than it was previously, then the snow will run off very, very quickly. It will flood the valleys immediately. Then all that water will drain away and you'll get a drought coming in behind it. 
When flooding happens, other bad things happen too. You get water supplies contaminated. You also get disruptions of agriculture. Some um, very sophisticated people, like the economist William Nordhaus, think we can manage these systems. They say, well, you know, this area gets uh, um, this area gets drier, this area gets uh, this other area gets warmer, uh, but we can move we can move our agriculture around. This is a bit like the sort of familiar theoretical ideas about capitalism where you you know you the market adjusts so that uh, you know this this type of worker goes out of business but the workers can in theory go over here and take on the jobs in some different sector of the economy unfortunately as we all know too well there's rather a lot of friction in that and there's rather a lot of friction in the restaking of of agriculture how do you feed the world while the agriculture is being disrupted. And then there are much more insidious things that it's very difficult to predict. Changing patterns of disease transmission. Um, and this is, of course, particularly relevant right now as uh, we're thinking about Africa and the way the Ebola virus is spreading. I mean, you start changing the patterns of infectious disease transmission and all hell can break loose. You also get new opportunities for the evolution of disease vectors. As humans are forced to migrate, under conditions of drought and malnutrition, it's much easier for disease vectors, bacteria, viruses to mutate and jump from other animals to us. So, final thing, you have forced migration of human populations with social disruption. So when we look into the future, it's not an orderly retreat of the people of Miami. Um, you know, they go to Minnesota or somewhere like that, uh, where it's nice and safe. It's much more vast storms disrupting the water supply, contaminating the water. People are undernourished. They are sick. They're carrying their sickness with them. They're moving. They're migrating into areas that are also under, certain, under some pressure you can see what this kind of future is going to be like. And it seems to me clearly we don't want that for our grandchildren. Next slide, please. So even though we don't know the chances of any particular scenario, the whole complex of scenarios is so frightening that we would be very well advised to avoid it. I often use the analogy of being in a city that's torn apart by a civil war with lots of different factions competing with one another. Suppose you decide to stay in that city. You have to go out every day. You have to find food and water and all the necessities of life. You can't tell if you're going to get gunned down by that particular faction, the Eagle faction, we'll call it, uh, as they come around a, a particular corner. That you can't tell. But you know that you're going to be very lucky to survive for days and weeks doing this regularly. And that's, I think, the way we should think about climate change. There's so much that can go wrong and can interact with other things that go wrong here that our descendants are going to be very lucky indeed if they escape some really catastrophic series of events if we let the planet warm up. Okay, next, please. Now, people often say, well, but look, they're going to be better off than us. This is a familiar right-wing economist argument. Look, we pay now for them, but look at the way that wages have been increasing, you know, over the last 150 years. They'll go on increasing. They'll be richer than us. They'll have more funds and resources to deal with it. So let's wait. Let's see what, uh, see how bad it gets, and then they can do something about it there with all the riches that they have. There's a real flaw in this argument, and that is that the extrapolation of this economic growth curve that goes up and up and up depends on supposing that societies are going to continue to be able to respond to the environmental shocks that attack them. And if we get that 
increased frequency of extreme events, vast amounts of resources are going to have to be poured in to um, coping with the effects of that. So I don't think we can conclude that our descendants are going to be better off than we are. I think we should conclude that the economic future is itself hostage to the phenomena of climate change. Next slide, please. All right. Now, suppose we actually got this far with the public. They agree that the scientists are right. The Earth is warming. We're causing it by emitting fossil fuels, by, um, by burning fossil fuels, emitting uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. It's going to have important adverse effects over the next century and beyond. And so everybody agrees now that we need to do something about the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. People used to say they've got to be, co they've got to be kept below 350 parts per million. We're now at roughly 395, 398. We have topped 400. These things go sort of fluctuate a little bit. Um, 400 is looking impossible. And so now people are talking about 450. A few people are talking about 500 or 550 parts per million. We've got to keep it at that. So how do we do it? Well, People who are in favor of Star Wars, the Merchants of Doubt, by the way, liked Ronald Reagan's Star Wars strategy, sometimes say, well, we, I know what we'll do. We'll shoot lots of sulfur particles into the atmosphere, and they'll reflect some of the incoming heat. And so we'll keep the greenhouse effect, but we'll send some of the energy back into space, and so we'll be able to balance it. You really trust? a one-shot experiment to do that and get it just right so that the Earth's temperature is just where you want it. You just got the right concentration of sulfur particles in the atmosphere. Well, if you, if you think that, you might think about other wonderful uh, environmental experiments of the past. When I grew up in England, I used to go for walks with my parents and there, we'd walk across the hills and there would be all of these dead rabbits. They were really pretty nasty, you know, corpses decaying all over the place. Now, why was that? Well, people some time back decided it would be a good idea to get rid of some of the Australian marsupial mammals they didn't like by introducing rabbits into Australia. Well, the rabbits, you know, the rabbit population, uh, this is sort of stereotypical, got quite big, quite fast, okay? And the local marsupial mammals started to die out. People said, oh, whoops, we don't want to lose all those marsupial mammals. We'll do something about the rabbits. And so they, they turned to a thing called the myxoma virus, and they started um, sending the myxoma virus out. And the myxoma virus gave rise to myxomatosis, and rabbits in Australia started dying at a fair clip, and so did rabbits everywhere. And that's why there were all those rabbit corpses. Here's another great experiment, DDT. DDT was a wonderful idea. We're going to cut down on all sorts of insect-borne diseases by spraying the world. And of course, as any serious evolutionary ecologist could have predicted, what you're going to get is DDT-resistant insects. And that's, in fact, what happened. Now, um, Another strategy is to say, well, look, let's keep burning fossil fuels, but let's capture the carbon. Let's take it, suck it out, and store it somewhere. And that can be done on a small scale. The trouble is nobody knows how to do it on anything like the scale that's needed. So the most likely solution to our problem is, and, and many, many people agree on this, is to substitute other forms of energy for fossil fuels. And that's why, you, of course, you get all the discussions about wind and solar power and so forth. Next slide, please. So there are renewable sources, wind, solar power, hydropower, geothermal power. These have no emissions involved in them. Of course, you've got to find ways of harnessing them, storing them, getting them into the right places at the right times. And the consensus view 
is that in the long run, say 80 years from now, the world's energy needs could be reliably supplied by these renewable sources. But we can't afford to wait that long. And so the consensus view is that we need some stopgap. And the stopgap is a very unappealing one. It's one that I opposed and demonstrated against in my youth, nuclear power. Now, Clark um, has found sources in which people say, we can do it. We can supply New York State or we can supply California on renewables. There's some question about that because uh, the, the proposals in question don't have the right kind of infrastructure built into them actually to get the energy to where it's needed. But let's give the authors that. The trouble is that what you can do for New York State next slide, please. and what you might be able to do for California now isn't the same. When you start mentioning nuclear power to people in this context, people go, no, no, that we mustn't do that. Nuclear power has led to disasters. And an example of this is that one of the most progressive countries on climate, the climate change issue, Germany, backed away from nuclear power, returned to coal, the worst of all uh, <coughs> fossil fuel sources, in light of the Japanese catastrophe. But if you actually look at the historical evidence, the statistical evidence, on the nuclear catastrophes that have happened since we started doing nuclear power, many of them done in a much less technologically sophisticated way than is now available, then the fallout in terms of human suffering, human disease, human disability, and human death is actually minuscule compared with the predicted effects of global warming. Nuclear power isn't nice, but its effects are likely to be a lot nicer than those of letting the planet warm up. One thing that may surprise you is that actually if you look at the records of Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, people who were exposed to enormous amounts of, ra of, of radiation, right? Their rates of disease are somewhat elevated over the general population, but not by anything like what you'd think. They are, they, even if you're in a nuclear uh, sort of holocaust as these people were in that region, your risks are less than the risks that are likely to come or the risks that will come from letting the planet warm up. Okay, keep going please. But now we come to the nub of the really hard problem, and I suspect the bit that's going to interest you the most. How can you get a global agreement to use nuclear power in the short term rather than fossil fuels, and to develop renewable energy and use it as soon as possible? And this is the point at which it seems to me the politics enters and gets really, really sticky. Next slide, please. So, Let's look at the ways in which countries have been emitting over the last decade or so. Look at the United States. Aren't we good? It's been going down. It's been going down a little bit. Nowhere near enough. But it's been going down a little bit. And looks what, look what's happened to India and China. They're going to take over as the great polluters, the great emitters. And somewhere in the middle of the century, their emissions will probably start to taper off and maybe we'll see them introduce some relatively small changes, which means that, they, that the graph, as it were, levels out somewhere. But Indonesia, Brazil, other parts of Asia, other parts of Latin America, perhaps parts of Africa, won't be far behind. If these countries are to develop, and if they don't have any alternatives to using fossil fuels, and especially the cheapest of all fossil fuels, coal, then they are going to have growth curves that are like this. And that's incompatible with keeping the planet cool enough. Next slide, please. 
So, as you probably know, people in India have very unreliable electricity. People in large parts of China and in large parts of Asia have very unreliable electricity. Virtually all of Africa, people have unreliable electricity. Large parts of uh, South America also. So you've got lots of countries that want to develop. They want to be part of a modern life, a modern economy. And the most efficient way they can do it is to use fossil fuels. One of the most endangered parts of the world is Bangladesh. Okay, the Bay of Bengal is very shallow and it's likely to be flooded. About a third of the population of the country is likely to be displaced. This spring, the government of Bangladesh decided to build electricity generating plants using coal on the edge of their last remaining big clump of forests. That's a double whammy because the trees are good for absorbing carbon and the coal, as it were, gives off more carbon emissions than um, natural gas, um, for example. Why did they do that? These are people who are on the front lines of the effects. Answer, they need to develop. They need economic development. They could get it if they were given extensive aid from the affluent parts of the world. The affluent parts of the world could provide them with the resources they need to develop nuclear power, to introduce renewables where it's possible. Then the affluent part of the world really could help them both develop and avoid polluting. Can you go back a slide, please? So they wouldn't have to go through this kind of, of growth curve. Forward, please. But there's another thing that happened this spring. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out with a new report. And in the appendix to that report, the affluent countries, led by the United States, I may say, declined to increase the aid to the developing world by the amounts needed to help them develop in a carbon-free fashion. So you've got Bangladesh dying to develop and probably dying because of the development. And you've got the United States and other affluent nations. The United States isn't alone saying, no, we're not going to help you do this in a thorough non-carbon way. So think about this in terms of justice. There was, although we didn't know it, a resource that the human species had. It was called the sink in the atmosphere into which we can pour carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. The Industrial Revolution started and Britain and then the United States and of course the other industrial countries put a lot of stuff into that sink. In fact, they took up almost all of the sink. Now, to be sure, they didn't know it, but we do know it now. So they've taken a resource, which was a human resource, and they've used up most of it. Now the poorer nations say, well, we want to do the same too. One might think that the just answer to this is to aid their development by huge transfers of funds that will enable them to go ahead and institute the kinds of energy programs that will keep the emissions under control. But at the moment, that isn't working. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, how do we get this across in a democracy? Remember where I started. There's a scientific consensus and Americans don't believe it. Then I said, and they don't understand just how severe the threats are. And we've got a, a really hard job to get that across because we can't offer specific scenarios. But suppose we got that far. Then we have to say to our fellow citizens, oh, by the way, we've got to build a lot of nuclear power stations. 
All this, by the way, in a climate in which the merchants of doubt are constantly obfuscating the issues. And then we say to them, and not only have we got to do that, but we've also got to, to do something really dramatic in terms of increasing foreign aid for large parts of the world. There's no way, it seems to me, that this is likely to prove politically viable as a program in the time available to us. Because one thing that you probably know about carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is that they hang around. So you get, by the end of the century, you'll get an effect, but at that stage, things in the atmosphere won't have come into equilibrium yet. The temperature will continue to rise and as long as that carbon stays there, which can be centuries, the temperature will remain the same. Once it's done, it's done. By the time the miner's canary has sung in response to the, the gas in the mine, it's too late. So how do we do it? All right, let me... The obvious solution to this is to institute global mechanisms to see ourselves as all citizens of the only planet that we have. I don't know how that can be done. I think Clark has uh, some ideas about how it might be done. Um, but I'm not really sure about that. This is a really hard problem and the last thing we need is to um, have as casualties in all of this the scientific understanding, the scientific knowledge, and the technology to put that into action. But there is here, Clark is right about one thing, there is here a fundamental contradiction within capitalism. It's not quite the one Marx foresaw, I think. It's this, we got a global problem. We got to cooperate. But you can't combine a phase of cooperation with the thought that when the cooperation is over, you all start engaging in cutthroat capitalistic competition again. Because what you've got to do is get people to coordinate their energy policies and work, as it were, for the common good. And then say to them, and by the way, when this is over, then we go back to just sort of, uh, um, you know, making things as cheaply as we can, grinding the, grinding the labor force down as much as possible, and then uh, um, making the biggest profits we can. Those, those two things are very, very hard to fit together. Because, of course, what countries will want to do is they'll want to come out of this process where, in which they revamp their entire infrastructure in a place that enables them to compete in the capitalist era that follows. And that makes agreements to develop energy and to transfer funds and so forth very difficult to obtain. So we've got to move into a phase of cooperation. And that phase of cooperation is, I think, incompatible with capitalism as we know it. Where I disagree with Clark is in thinking that the only solution here is revolutionary change rather than the guided evolution, hopefully fast evolution of capitalism to understand the importance of various kinds of global constraints. Perhaps there are some encouraging signs in the reception that Thomas Piketty's book has, uh, uh, has gotten recently. Um, perhaps there are signs that people will take the problems of inequality sufficiently seriously to change the economic framework in which we are working. I am part of uh, an international group consisting of philosophers, economists, and a few business people who are trying to work out blueprints for how that might be done. I don't think there's an easy way to do it. And so in the end, Clark may be right. But the problem is terribly serious. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry to have gone on so long.
All right. Yeah. Just a second. Everybody can hear you. Then. Sure. You mentioned you're part of a group that's studying uh, inequality. Yeah. Um, do you believe at some point it may be shown that uh, inequality is uh, affecting profit margins, affecting uh, optimization uh, globally? Some, some people in the group believe that. So they believe that actually on... on Convincingly. Yeah. I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, I'm sure there are, I mean, there are economists within the group who would be able, I think, to give you a better answer to the question than I can. I can only report on what they say, uh, which is that they think, they think that that's the case. Um, I mean, arguably, there are, I mean, m one of my colleagues, Joe Stieglitz, thinks something like this. Um, but, uh, but certainly there are, there, there are other economists whom I've heard express that view. I'm not, I mean, I know some economics, but you know, I'm talking about people who win <laughs> Nobel Prizes, and they know a hell of a lot more than I do. It's uh, an international group also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was actually, uh, it's actually started by um, a guy who is Indian by descent, but who teaches at the European Business School in Fontainebleau. He's the, he's the guy who convened this group. Um, it's just getting off the ground. It only it met for the first time this spring. I was uh, looking at the possible solution being a stopgap nuclear solution. I don't see how that can be possible in a market economy when of all the alternative energy options, nuclear is the most expensive. Yeah. Uh, and not only is it, not only is most expensive for the United States, it would be even more expensive in the, the rest of the world. So I don't see how that could possibly yeah. be a solution. Very good, very good question. Okay, so clearly the solution has to have built into it that you make the price of um, emission, fuels that emission, uh, sorry, sources of energy that emit greenhouse gases uh, realistically high. I mean, many, many uh, economists and policy makers have said that the first step in all of this must be to uh, impose a carbon tax so that these things are priced in terms of not only what the market will bear, but also in terms of the damage that they do. Okay? So that's the first step. So you adjust the prices. Now, then after that, you then try to get the energy needs of the world um, secured insofar as you can by means of using renewable sources. So you introduce those as quickly as you can in all the places that you can do that quickly. After that, all you have left is nuclear power. So the, the, if you've got the other prices of the fossil fuels raised properly so that, that, that they now cost more than nuclear power, and if you've exhausted the means of, of using the renewable sources insofar as you can, then the cheapest way of making up the difference then becomes nuclear power. But of course that depends on a number of changes within the market structure, changes that would have to be instituted by um, government measures starting with a carbon tax. Now, as you rightly pointed out, the poor nations cannot afford nuclear power stations. And that's why they have to be, as it were, given them for free. They have to be given them free and the structures that, uh, that come with them. If we're going to solve this problem, we can't, we just can't have nations around the globe sort of saying, well, we want to develop and the only thing we can afford is to burn lots of coal. We've got lots of coal. India has piles of coal. China has piles of coal. Um, you know, let's go out and burn some coal. You've got to, as it were, give incentives. And the right, the, the obvious way to do that is to make the, um, make the other energy sources free for them. That's the extent of the wealth transfers that have to take place. Do you want to come back on that? Yeah. I'm, uh, I, uh, why should we, I mean, uh, not only is nuclear very expensive, even if we make carbon very, very expensive, we still have to finance the nuclear 
and it's very expensive. It's very expensive. Yeah. And if we're going to give it away, uh, make then it it's even more expensive. Then it's even more yeah. expensive. And then all the other question is, people think that Fukushima as a problem has gone away. It's not. That those plants are still polluting the uh, Pacific Ocean. Yeah. All it, they say that the Pacific Ocean is almost dead. Uh, in terms well, of fish and uh, whatever you have in the fi you know, fish and all kinds of seals are coming up with dying on the beaches and um, you know this is a, a, a horrible problem that's just getting worse because they can't stop it um, so nuclear I don't think is a real solution it's very very expensive and if we're going to give it away why don't we just change the way our whole pol our whole economy is structured uh, and so that we don't have any uh, dangerous energy production systems okay well we could sit down and really try to work through the details of this because that's what it's going to depend on if Let's assume for the moment that renewable forms of energy can't meet the world's energy budget and that the, the people who've investigated this question and have seen a really significant shortfall um, in substitution of renewable forms of energy. Uh, so then there are actually two options. One option is to say, well, we just have to learn to live with the amount of energy that we can generate from renewable sources. Call that option one. Option two is to say, well, we make up the difference or some of the difference by introducing nuclear power stations. You say that's going to be very expensive. Indeed it is. It means that nations won't be able to waste resources in the ways that uh, that they have been doing but let me tell you something that one of my undergraduates at Columbia worked out this guy is very has you know pretty good training in both philosophy and economics and uh, um, he actually took the US military budget and he asked the, the following question is the US military budget enough to cover this at existing prices the answer is easily. So if we stopped, if we actually stopped funding vast numbers of uh, um, weapon systems and uh, um, large, large armies, etc., 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 it could be done just like that. So there is a way to do it. Now, that remain, the, the, a serious question remains. Would you prefer to live in a world that... Um, reduces its energy usage by the necessary amount or would you prefer to make up the difference and there are some things that we can all do to conserve and conservation is really good but conservation is actually built into the calculations that I've been working with here so I've assumed that people already go lean and clean they do all the things that we know about doing to save um, energy you still can't make up the world's energy needs if you want if you want to have people able to use electricity for the all the kinds of purposes that we use it there's only so far you can cut back you look skeptical I mean we could all we could all try going back to the land and just sort of burning candles and <laughs> no, that's not a particularly good idea either um, <laughs> Going to bed at at, at sunset, uh, you know, at sunset and getting up at the dawn, um, you know, maybe there's some charm in that. But much of the world is really ambitious for the kind of uses of electricity that we have and that we're used to. India would love it. China would love it. A lot of the, you know, Africa would love it. I mean, do you want to deny the people that opportunity? Or do you want to, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to see how you, how you save enough energy to get by on renewable sources and solve this problem. You still look, you still look unconvinced. Let's <laughs> we'll talk we'll about come it back up. to you. Let's talk about it after. 
Hi, Professor uh, Kitchen. My name is Raymond Lada, and uh, I just want to say that I really, um, I really appreciate this uh, presentation that you've made and what you're doing and exposing, you know, the, you know, the bringing to people the science of, you know, global climate change, global warming, and uh, there's a big fight in society about this. And you're talking about taking on the climate and you know the the merchants of doubt and so on and so forth, and really taking this information out into society and that's what this store is helping to do providing people with a platform to learn the science of global warming as Clark was saying in his opening remarks and I do think that you know bringing this together in terms of the actual trends of what's happening and you know climate how it's affecting the oceans rising sea levels and fighting this out it's extremely important so I really thank you for what you're doing and bringing that expertise to it now All I right. want to identify what I think is a big contradiction in the presentation and this is again that is here you are emphasizing and foregrounding the scale and urgency of what we're confronting look this system capitalism has brought humanity into the planet to the brink of catastrophe what I want to sort of touch on here and explore a little with you and get some back and forth going is the contradiction between the scale and urgency of what we're confronting this is not just in one country, in one region of the world. This is global. This is the planet. And the urgency, you put the numbers before us in terms of rising temperatures, rising sea levels, and it's actually accelerating. I mean, just even, I just want to sort of point out that while there's a certain leveling of carbon emissions in the U.S. that you point to, mm -hmm. even that number is misleading because the U.S. is outsourcing a lot of its carbon emissions. Studies have been done in yeah. China that, Good. that Good. this Good is point. very <laughs> important. This yeah. is very important. The U.S. is outsourcing its global... So on a global scale, if you take China's carbon emissions, a good portion, I mean, some estimates are 20 to 30 percent of that is owing to the operations of transnational corporations and all the subcontracting networks in China. So, you know, even those numbers, and I want to sort of, you know, parse this out, we have to understand the scale and urgency. This is what you're underscoring. So what I am saying is that there's a contradiction between that and the fact that your proposals and your thinking is contained within, is circumscribed within the existing economic and social system. What can we do in terms of agreements among countries? What can we do in terms of, you know, moving from one energy grid to another? But what, what, what disturbs me is that you are taking as a given the capitalist imperialist system, that this is intact. This is what we have to work within, perhaps around, but that itself is not being called into question on the level of, look, if the scale and urgency is what it is, and as you've underscored, then we need the most radical transformation of economy and society in world history. We need a socialist communist revolution to change the very structures of how society functions. Because what underlies this, and you know, you talked about voting, and you talked about the manipulation of public opinion, all of which is true, the dissemination of false information. But underlying all of this is the economics the priorities of a system that functions according to profit, to expansion. Look, they're expanding their drilling in the Arctic. They, they're, they're, they're going deeper and deeper to extract more fossil fuel, applying more technology to that. This system is governed by the drive for profit and there's competition. You know, they're opening up the Arctic. Who's going there? The French, you know, the Norwegians, the US, the Russians. Yep. The yep. world is if you want to put it this way, they're oyster to grab and to destroy. This is how they look Would at that it. Would we had more oysters? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I was going to talk about it, but I'm not going to go there. But, but what I'm saying is this is, they, this is a system that operates according to its own logic and dynamics. It's not that there are people who are deciding to mislead, which is true. That's the essence of the matter. It's that the system has its own lot. Seven of the ten largest corporations in the U.S. and on a world scale are either auto or oil. This is built into the functioning. The U.S. military is the largest consumer of oil as a single institutional entity. This is how the system operates. People are treated as objects of exploitation and the natural world is viewed 
as, as a resource to be, yes to be grabbed up and poured into production for profit whether it's the destruction of the rainforest by agribusiness or fracking or what have you this is the dr the logic of the system so we need to dig deep they're drilling deep we need to <laughs> dig deep into the causes of this and the solution and it really does as i said require the most radical revolution in human history and that's what this story is all about that's what Avakian's new synthesis of communism is all about we need to actually create a new social and economic system with new values in which people look at the planet as something that needs to be protected for current and future generations we need a whole new way of operating in which it's no longer profit that sets the terms but what is for the betterment of humanity and the protection of the ecosystems of the planet. That's what a socialist revolution makes possible. Because you're no longer functioning according to this logic of profit and private ownership over these means of production and the resources to serve the ever increasing accumulation of profit. And I do want to call to people's attention the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America, which actually sets out a framework and a vision for how we could actually do this. Create a new society and economy in which you are no longer feasting on the world. The U.S. economy is no longer based on global, you know, cheap labor manufacturing and ripping off the resources of the world. In which you're actually planning an economy according to the needs of humanity in which you're actually creating sustainable cities in which you're moving away decisively from fossil fuels whether it's in transportation or in agriculture in which you are moving away from the whole consumer society based on new gadgets you know every year every month every day which are destroying the environment and in which you are imbuing people with a sense of purpose and commitment to the well-being of the planet and humanity that's the revolution that we need and what I'm saying is we have to really take seriously what you're saying about the scale and the urgency and then we have to look at the scale and urgency of the solution which is revolution which is creating a new social and economic system that operates according to wholly different priorities which is about emancipating humanity and allowing all of these resources in other words people like yourself the scientist the technology exists i'm not a scientist <laughs> no i'm saying this you're a philosopher but i'm saying the people the scientists i'm saying we have a lot going for us we have the knowledge that knowledge cannot be put to the solution of this problem that knowledge exists we have the creativity and the energy of scientists we have the determination of the activists in the streets we have an actual vision and framework for a new society that's concentrated in this constitution for the new socialist republic in north america which is based on this new synthesis of communism we have to build and we are building a movement for revolution that is actually flowing from the great needs of humanity and the need to protect the planet and we do have to square the circle of the scale and urgency of the crisis and the scale and urgency of the solution that's required and that's what i want to sort of put on the okay. table okay good that was fantastically good i mean really <laughs> there's so much in what you said that i uh, that i agree with so the first thing you say this is a very small point but it, it does you're absolutely right about that that line that shows the united states going down and, Ch and china going up some of china should be um as it were credited to <laughs> to us but in a certain sense that doesn't matter i mean what's really what that diagram shows is the ways in which when countries that have been undeveloped previously start to develop the emissions that come out of factories in those countries or, or out of the land that those countries occupy goes up that's the point it may ultimately be traceable to the big bad country that you know flings around that it's dollars in this way uh, but that's that's not really the serious issue the really serious issue is the way in which future development of individual countries contributes to continued 
high levels of emissions of greenhouse gases. And, the, and that's what we've got to get under control. Now, the second point that you make is, uh, there's a contradiction in my account. I take it the contradiction is this, the measures that I'm taking are too mild and too slow to get the job that I've described done. And I think that's a very serious and perfectly reasonable challenge. But, to Kwokwe, I say, you too, I think the chances of the kind of change that you want coming about in the way that you want it to come about through you know, the, the galvanizing of a group of people who are, I mean, we both agree on this, completely misled by this obfuscating atmosphere that is put out by Fox News and the other uh, media sources and by the merchants of doubt. That kind of political basis is very, very inert and very slow to move. So I don't see your political solution getting things done in time either. But you and I agree on something very fundamental, and that is that we need a new economic system. We need an economic system in which it is not all about short-term profit to individuals, and especially not all about short-term massive profit, profits for a very small number of individuals, but a system in which somehow other values are being registered. Values of equality and giving everybody as it were, a fair chance, values of preserving various things that are important for future generations, values of humanity. Now, the group that I was talking about understands that completely. That is, in a certain sense, the premise from which we're operating, that capitalism needs reform in ways that bring those values into the equation. So the, 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 the guy who started this, Subramanian Rangan, to give him a name, um, began this with the following thought. How do we teach the future people who will run the businesses around the world to represent these values in their decision making? And that led him then to consult with economics and philosophers. Philosophers, as it were, to chart out ways of articulating those values and to work with economists who know something about these things to develop an economic system in which those values are represented, in which the public good doesn't disappear. The public good is right in there as part of what is to be maximized. Now, that's the way we're working. And the reason I brought up Thomas Piketty is that he seems to me also um, thinking along similar lines, thinking about a particular kind of value that has been lost, or rather a particular kind of n n unvalue or anti-value that has been introduced, the unvalue of, of inequality. Uh, we've got to get, as it were, that back into the economic framework. Now, your way of doing this is through Baba Vakian's movement, a political movement that will try, presumably, to capture enough public interest and enough voters so that it eventually succeeds in North America. But North America is only part of the problem. Even if Avakian succeeded here, we need that movement on a global scale has to be done on a global scale. That's the, that's the important point I'm making. I think it, there's a very serious chance that neither your way nor my way will be successful. But I think um, if we keep on like this, each of us will have the right of the, uh, to accuse the other of being the pot that calls the kettle black. We just don't know how to do this fast enough, and I would agree with that. But let us have, let us have more strategies than one here. Let, let people like me see if there are enough people within the contemporary, um, you know, theorists of capitalist economy who feel the need to reform it. Because if that starts to happen, then maybe we can begin to get somewhere. Because the Council of Economic Advisors in 10, 15 years' time says to the president, 
Mr. President, you're doing, you know, dinosaur economics, voodoo economics, perhaps, to give it a name. Um, so that's a route. I've also got another worry. Um, and this, and I'll con make a confession. So I grew up, um, poor kid in England at the time when British socialism seemed to have achieved some really remarkable things after the Second World War. The British socialist movement is a much less theoretical movement than the communist movement. Um, but it actually achieved some things. Of course, they all got whittled away long before we got to Margaret Thatcher, and when we got to Margaret Thatcher, it got even worse. But the model I have is of an evolutionary one. It is, it is of that rather than the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution. And what worries me about that is that while the political changes, the changes in thinking about values that are necessary for us to get this problem under control are occurring, some of the means with which those problems might be solved get destroyed in huge convulsive clashes. And so vast amounts of coal are poured into the atmosphere, so carbon dioxide is poured into the atmosphere from coal by factories working around the clock to produce munitions as the revolutionaries fight it out. Because the capitalist order is unlikely to fold unless it's persuaded without a, str without a struggle. So I'm worried. I'm worried that that the route that the route you're going is both too slow, and that along the way, important things for solving this problem will be uh, abandoned. So I've got a different kind of evolutionary socialistic model in mind. The model, but I think you and I share a fundamental set of values, uh, and we can see in 20 or 30 years time, if I'm still around, then you probably will be. Um, uh, which of us made more progress? Good evening. Hi. Hi, thank you for your research. I wanted to ask you a question um, regarding uh, politics aside and revolution aside. Yeah. Um, what's the science, what is your view on the concept of nuclear waste and the spent fuel rod? Even if you use nuclear as a stopgap measure, how about nuclear waste? What is the what do you believe? What is your what are your thoughts on that? I think there are ways of of um, uh, burying it securely. I think if we think really hard about this, and if we commandeer certain parts of the world and say these are going to be the places. Well, uh, I am told that the, virtually all the population of Nevada lives um, in about a twentieth or less of the state. There's really quite a large amount of, of, of land there that I can think of a very good use for. Yeah. Sahara Desert looks pretty good to me. Um, I mean, you've got, look, I mean, you've got to have, as I say, international institutions to guard these things. I mean, this is not possible if you have, um, in, unless it's under really serious control and supervision. But imagine a... Um, some some sort of central repositories for nuclear waste. One might be in the middle of um, the eastern parts of the Soviet, former Soviet Union, um, or in the Gobi Desert, another in the Sahara Desert, and one in, in, in Nevada. I don't know about South America, um, but you've got, it seems to me you've got to have serious, dedicated storage areas, and you've got to have, um, uh, you know, th those have got to be really secured, and the this, this storage has got to be very, very carefully supervised. I am concerned, I mean, the point that was made earlier about the way in which the, the, the Pacific Ocean has been affected by the, um, by the nuclear um, a flux from uh, Japan that strikes that is that is a very worrying thing 
But the damage that's being caused to the oceans by that incident is minute in comparison with the damage that's being caused to the oceans by um, not only the, the direct effect of heating, but also by the acidification of the oceans. So, um, I mean, I, I, when I was younger, I was a firm and fierce opponent of nuclear energy. I thought it was profoundly dangerous. Um, but in light of what I, I now have come to understand about the, the known fallout from nuclear catastrophes and the predicted fallout from uh, temperature rising, I'll I'll bite the bullet, and I'll uh, I'll go for some nuclear power, if it's needed to make up the energy difference, with a tolerable way of the whole world living. I mean, this is really hard. I mean, you the, you know you have to start from the following baseline. I mean, I think that the 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 the, the, the woman who spoke earlier very eloquently in this challenge about nuclear energy. Um, I think what she sees is that there's an awful lot of stuff that we can do to reduce our energy needs. So let's do that, all of that first. Let's imagine that happening on a global scale compatibly, compatibly with full development for the countries that are crying out for it. So that gives us then uh, an, an amount of energy that's needed to sustain that. Then let's produce as much as we can, as quickly as we can of that using renewable sources. All I'm saying is if at that point we fall short, nuclear power is the place then to make the difference. So that's the general picture. I probably wasn't clear enough about it in, in presenting it. but. You do everything you can to reduce. After you've reduced, you do everything you can to use renewables. And then after that, you make up the shortfall in terms of nuclear power. Hi. Um, in the Philippines, where I live, um, I used to travel like municipality to municipality to talk climate change. And I told them that it's the rich uh, country that to make this way we experience this effect. But tonight, I thank you for doing this advocacy because there in the Philippines, I cannot say who's the right people to tell them because they're the rich country. I'm just trying to disseminate also that this is the thing where uh, uh, the, uh, the things we experience right now is the effect of climate change. Okay, my I remember the latest. Um, earthquake in Japan when they had this earthquake and then they have the tsunami people most of the people there uh, are safe because they're prepared of the earthquake and then second there were uh, people also are more safe because they were prepared of the tsunami but then after that the nuclear power was affected right if you remember that yeah and people were just said that it's worse than earthquake and you worse than uh, tsunami but right now the way you present it uh, you said that nuclear uh, nuclear power is the short term for the for uh, to have to solve the problem especially in the third world country but you should re also remember that the third world country are the, the countries are prone to disasters we knew already that it's expensive and then if like if we bring it to bangladesh and we knew already that bangladesh also is prone to floods storm shorts earthquake and other hazards so what if if we have then a double problem for doing that it's just like my opinion thing because i know third world country asian countries are prone to disaster and what if other people, right, other rich people will be convincing to say, okay, I'll finance this for the third world country as long as I continue my use of my more power electricity here. So I just like a bit, oh, I need to tell this that maybe you can open also a mind for another thing and doing not just a nuclear war power. You're absolutely right that any, any country that uses um, a nuclear 
reactor is going to have to have sufficient infrastructure built into it, right, both to deliver the energy that its citizens need and to maintain that in the face of all sorts of natural catastrophes. All of that has to be given. That's part of the cost of, of doing this. The, the, the picture that I have in mind is not one in which the rich countries go on polluting and emitting carbon into the atmosphere. It's one in which they lead the way. They say, um, you know, we are forswearing further emissions. You know, I mean, they may in the short term have to use natural gas bef while the nuclear power stations are being get built or, or the renewable framework is being set up or whatever. But in the end, what they're, what they're aiming towards is a state in which they no longer use fossil fuels. And they try, they, they, they aim neither to leave the, kind of the poorer countries of the world in a state where they are not allowed to develop, nor to have those countries develop by simply going through that cycle that we saw in the graph that uh, <laughs> you rightly commented on. Um, so, so here's really the dilemma. If you don't find a way of doing this safely, with oversight, with international protections for the poor countries, what do they do? Do they simply not develop economically? Do they not provide their citizens with all of the things that access to reliable electricity brings? Or do you set up the conditions under which they can develop in ways that are non-polluting. The line I, I, I'm taking is that they have, in a certain sense, a right to develop. And I want them to be able to exercise that right while still keeping the emissions under control. It's an awful lot of framework that has to be done, and the details that you brought out are profoundly relevant to that. You can't just say, all right, Oh, I'll, give, I'll write a check to the, to the guy who's currently in charge of country X, which wants to develop, and now he'll put in place the, the... That's not the way. This has to work through a certain kind of abandonment of sovereignty across the board. We all have to feel ourselves part of a global community in which we work together on this problem, and in which the oversight is done by some intergovernmental, international body. That's absolutely crucial for this. Otherwise, you, you, you are going to get disasters. You're also going to get inefficiencies. You're going to get all the usual things that can go wrong. You know, um, uh, the forces of capitalism, I'm going to echo your point here, um, which will incline the corrupt politician to, uh, um, to sell the, uh, the right to build the facility, whatever it is, to, um, to some uh, sleazy ally who then will cut the corners to make greater profits, blah, 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 blah. And so you'll get something that's incredibly unsafe and vulnerable. That cannot be allowed to happen. And that's why we do need, he's right, we do need a real change of values here. Uh, but it's got to, it seems to me it's got to come from constructing a global framework in which we think together. And as I said at the end, if we start doing that, we can't go back at the end of it to the exploitative global capitalism that we have now. Capitalism will have to change to that extent, either in his way or in mine. So we've been talking about how economic systems could change to deal yeah. with this problem. Um, but it seems like, and you talked about this some, the first major problem is getting people to realize that there actually is a problem and um, that there's something we Doesn't can do about Doesn't that seem it. so long ago now, right? <laughs> I mean, that's why I call it the easy problem. <laughs> um, so I was just curious, especially now that this issue has become embroiled in so much politics and you know religious uh, contention, how do you actually get people to realize that, it, that it's a problem? Because it doesn't seem to me like it's just a, a question of misinformation, but also that it's temporarily beneficial for people to believe that, you know, 
putting in carbon taxes or something wouldn't actually do anything. So um, do you have any ideas? You have a terrifically good point here. I mean, the, um, the forces that a political solution has to fight here are really, really very powerful indeed. And they have such rhetorical devices, uh, you know, uh, changing the American way, not understanding the exceptionalism of America, uh, tinkering with the can-do attitude that has made us strong, um, you know, internationalizing us when what has made America distinct is our rugged individualism, blah, 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 blah. A whole huge mythology that is, that is behind this. It's interesting that you put this in terms of religion. I mean, I think there is a religious aspect, but in certain respects, my inclination would be to think that certain kinds of religious people are actually on the side of, should I say, the angels here, in that they've already got the, some idea of stewardship for future generations built into their worldview. I mean, that's, that's something that maybe to answer your question more directly, that's something that may be exploitable. There may be contradictions within certain kinds of religious frameworks too. You know, on the one hand, we don't want people in tinkering with our way of life, but on the other, the idea of a certain kind of stewardship. And if one can emphasize the stewardship part of it, then perhaps we can make some, some environmental progress here. I don't know about that. But this is, I mean, this is enormously hard. And I feel that after so many years of debate, things have hardened. So to be, as it were, somebody who has a particular complex of political views, let's call them Republican views, then, as it were, you're automatically drawn to a particular position on the reality of, uh, of anthropogenic global warming. And that's terrible. That, um, you know, one thing that may do this is another really huge mega storm. Uh, it's quite clear that that kind of experience does loosen up people to be open to the reality of, of what's going on, even if it's not justified because it often isn't. I mean, many climate scientists will say, okay, so you've got this huge storm and it had these, these, these huge and devastating effects. Was that really due to global warming? No, I can't say that. What I can say is that events like that are more probable because of global warming. But can I say that that event would not have happened but for global warming? No. See, I mean, when responsible scientists do say that, but maybe they should keep their mouths shut at that point. <laughs> All right, I guess that uh, my question nicely follows that one. So um, on the point of, um, so in your presentation you discussed how people systematically are bad at reasoning about say the means and the tail behavior of probability distributions. I was wondering if um, as a philosopher and an educator you could talk a little bit about um, why people find like reasoning about probability distributions challenging and what we can do to make them more comfortable with thinking about reality in terms of probabilities. I have a friend who's done a lot of work with subjects on their ability to use statistics and to reason about things like this. You may have heard of him. He's a German um, uh, psychologist named Gerd Gigerenzer. And uh, he has, um, he's done all sorts of interesting experiments on people, uh, th the ways in which people make good decisions and ways in which they make bad decisions. And he's often employed by doctors and hospitals and medical systems and legal systems to uh, improve reasoning in these contexts. Um, he's a much better person to, uh, to go to than me. Because this is a guy who's actually done some serious empirical work on, on what makes it difficult for people to understand various kinds of statistical things. Actually, I don't think it is so hard to understand the effects of distributional events when you see uh, that slide that I had with the two bell curves and the one that goes to the right. I mean, that, that's pretty simple. Visually, people can get that, especially if, uh, if, you know, if I were really clever and sophisticated and I could do a little sort of uh, video thing where I sort of, uh, I, squashed out, I squashed the top a bit and had a fat tail out the end. Uh, people get that, but 
if you give people sort of standard all sorts of standard probability um, reasoning, they do badly. So, um, read Gerd Gigerenzer. Um, he's got he's written some lovely accessible books, and uh, um, and he has ideas about how this can improve. Um. We should I, probably. I, if, if that's gonna, what I was going gonna, to do. We're going to have a little bit of. Yeah, uh, I wanted to sort of bring things to a close. I did want to raise two things and I give actually, you the I, final word. Because there is, there is, there is an uh, an, uh, an organism to which I have a duty. I, I have a I, small I, dog that I have to get back <laughs> and walk, and and so I'm going to have to leave here at 9:30, and I want some time just to sort of. Um, right. Yeah. All right. Right. Just uh, the two things I thought that came up in the conversation this evening that are really important. One is actually how serious the problem is. It just really cannot be understated. And I think the other issue that came up was that the problem can only be resolved on an international scale. It cannot be resolved on a country by country scale. In just in connection with that, I think it is really important though, uh, for just so nobody got a wrong impression. The the proposals and the political program and the analysis that Baba Vakin has been put it forward is actually rooted in internationalism. It's just something that he has brought forward more strongly than has ever incurred before in the international communist movement. He's often fond of saying, you, you know, internationalism, the whole world comes first. And that the whole world is for us the decisive arena in which the future of humanity is actually going to be resolved. I think that the issue that we didn't resolve this evening is is the question of political power. For whom and for what? And whether the solutions proffered could even be attained. Are they commensurate, number one, but could they be attained at all without a global change in political power? And so with those remarks, I, I, if you want to have a, a few, if you wanted to say something else final. Um, no, I mean, I think, you, I think you're absolutely right about Bob Avakian. I mean, he's, he's an internationalist, but getting revolution to work internationally seems to me a very, very hard task indeed. Um, uh, there was something you said at the beginning that I wanted to respond to. What was your, what was your very first point? I said that we both agreed, or all of us here agreed on the on the uh, the intensity of the problem. Mm -hmm. how, how oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, I I've I've get talked about this in many uh, many fora and in many university campuses. And um, a friend of mine told me that he'd heard about my having given a lecture on this topic, and um, he'd asked his informant. Um, so so what did he say? And the message that was reported to him was, we're screwed. We're really screwed! <laughs> uh, which I think is actually a pretty good, uh, except I keep trying to find ways out of this box. Look, there's one hope that you could all have, and nobody has brought up, and it's very interesting because it's typically the first thing that gets brought up in conversations when I, when I talk on university campuses. Maybe this is going to be like fluorocarbons all over again. Somebody is going to discover a quick techni technical fix and it'll all just be fine. You know, there's some way of, of treating fossil fuels, you know, an, a lovely little spray that you, that you, that you, that you, 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 you put on the coal and nothing goes wrong. You know, it's all lovely. No more carbon comes out. Um, if that were to happen, if that were to happen, we'd solve this problem. But I think you probably believe, and I also believe, that that would in a way be a missed opportunity because this, this potential crisis is a moment at which people can think harder about the kinds of values that you want to bring into the conversation and I want to bring into the conversation too. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs>